The Compaq Macintosh series was a line of 10 different all-in-one computers sold between 1984 and 1995, beginning with the original Macintosh through to the Color Classic. Today we have the last three models in the lineup on the bench. The cool thing about these Compaq Macs is that they are so small and handy. I always seem to find a spot on the bench for one of these machines, even when it's really messy. I tend to use the Color Classic whenever I need to test some software quickly or to make diskettes for an earlier Mac, because these machines are compatible with regular diskettes that work on modern machines, and also the much older 400 and 800k diskettes. I can quickly download a file on a modern PC or Mac to a diskette, and then move the file to an older type of diskette on these machines. That is exactly what I tried to do the other day. Unfortunately, the Color Classic failed to display any graphics on the display, this was not totally unexpected, because the display has been glitchy for months before this happened. This Mac is restored in a previous video, and has a fresh set of caps, and a good battery. Being busy with other projects, I put it aside, and grabbed a Macintosh Classic. This Mac is unrestored, so I decided to look inside, before I turned it on. Unfortunately, I found some leaky caps, and nasty green corrosion on the power connector. Still being busy with that other projects, I grabbed an unrestored Classic 2. Unfortunately, this Mac had a garbled screen, so I think I'm gonna have to pause the project I'm working on, and fix up these Macs instead. Ok, let's start with the oldest one, the Macintosh Classic. My old label on top here says, nice and clean inside, quick test ok. Well, it's not nice and clean anymore. The previous owner seems to have dropped this machine, because there is a nasty dent here. And one much larger dent here. And it seems to have had some hack at some point, because there is a loose cable coming through the case here. It has a couple of more smaller dents all over the case. And the reset switch has been broken off. And the usual disclaimer, of course. Please don't poke around inside CRT displays or power supplies. They may contain high voltages, even with the cord unplugged. That being said, to get inside one of these machines, you need a very long T15. Either a screwdriver or a bit like this. And that is to reach the two screws that are hiding away inside the carrying handle here. They have already been removed since I just checked inside this machine. And then we have two T15 screws down here. My preferred method to get inside one of these is to push on the connectors at the back here. And more often than not, the cover will come off from the front piece, enough to pull the system out. Well, that is a really odd hack. That cable coming through the case doesn't seem to go anywhere. I guess I'll remove it and we'll see what the heck it's all about. Um, we have a date inside here, September of 1991. Well, that is really odd. It's just a piece of cable. I think that's an old phone cable. And it's obviously going nowhere. Let's have a look inside that heat shrink. Well, that is really odd. All the wires are just soldered together. Why would anyone install a cable inside a vintage Mac? And then just solder all the wires together. That is really strange. The machine is very clean indeed. It has a small amount of soot on the cable here, but aside from that, it still looks factory new inside here. Uh, this machine seems to have a RAM expansion card here. Well, that's a nice bonus. It doesn't say how much RAM, but I'll check later. And here's our problem. These caps are leaking uh, that electrolyte has found its way inside the connector here and caused some corrosion inside the power connector here. So that definitely needs to be cleaned up. From underneath the machine we can now access these screws to remove both drives. This piece here seems to be molten in place but there is a hole that will allow us to reach that screw inside. With those screws removed, 
we can now remove both drives in one go because they are screwed together in one piece. Man, that is a very clean machine. I don't think this Mac has been used much. Well, it's the first time I restore one of these. But from what I can tell, the analog board is only held in place with one screw up here. So now we can disconnect the analog board from the tube and a tiny speaker cable down here. The wires to the neck board are soldered at both ends. So we need to remove the ground cable here and remove it together with the analog board. The tube in this machine is made by Clinton and it's super clean. So it's probably in excellent condition. Well, that's a bit unusual. The fan is made by Canon. I don't think I have seen a Canon fan before. This piece is indeed molten in place with these tabs. So to access some of these screws, you definitely need a Mac cracker. The chassis is also held in place with these tabs here. There is a tiny, tiny amount of dust here and inside that fan. But for a machine from 1991, that is minimal. But since we're taking the machine apart, I might as well clean everything. I'll do all the cleaning off camera. Okay, I'll wash the board and while it dries, let's take care of the classic too. I left the case in a Retrobrite box, so hopefully it will look nicer when it's time to reassemble it. This machine hasn't yellowed as much, but it definitely needs some peroxide too. My notes on top here says no leaky battery, very clean and minus RAM. So not sure what that means, but maybe someone snatched the RAM in this machine. Well, I'm not sure if I should call it very clean, but it's definitely decent. Just like the other machine, it does have some soot on the cable here and a very small amount of dust. The date inside the lid is January 1992. Before we continue, I'd like to thank my favorite sponsor, PCBWay. Today we are going to use these tiny little PCBs. Very cheap and simple projects and very useful for Macs from this era. We're gonna get back to these later in the video. But for now, thank you PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Aside from making excellent PCBs like these, they also do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication and injection molding. Check out PCBWay.com and try them out in your next PCB projects. This machine is very similar to the Macintosh Classic, so I may actually skip ahead here a bit. Well, this board has two SIM sockets with nothing in them, so maybe that's what I meant by minus RAM. Unfortunately, I also noticed here that this board has a completely different set of caps. So I'm not sure how we're gonna go about this. And they are leaking. I may not have these caps in my stash, but we definitely are going to remove them anyways. Yeah, I totally skipped ahead here. Because from what I can tell, these machines are identical. Aside from the motherboard. Same analog board, same chassis, and the same tube. So we can move on, and now we'll get back to this machine, once it's washed and clean. Okay, moving to the Color Classic. This machine is so weird, I used to hate these, but I have really grown to like it. It's weird, sort of in a good way. We have already restored this machine on this channel, but now this machine has a black screen. It chimes, and we have high voltage, but nothing on the display. This machine is very different from the other two, in every possible way. So first of all, the motherboard comes out without any need to remove the cover. As I mentioned, this board has new fresh caps. It's very clean and quite likely in a working order. I have tried this machine with a new battery, but I have removed it because that's where we're going to install that PCB today. To get inside one of these, we need to remove two screws at the top of the case and two more screws underneath the machine. You don't need a Mac cracker, but it does make it a bit easier. With those four screws out, 
we can remove the cover. Overall, this machine looks a lot more modern than the other two inside. I don't know what the fault is with this Mac, but I have a pretty good guess. So we're gonna disconnect everything from the analog board. And two more wires, the speaker, and the ground cable. Okay, let's start with the oldest board. The Macintosh Classic. Every single cap is leaking, and there is corrosion on several of the chips. But I can't see any permanent damage. So I'd say we caught this one on time. There has been two videos recently by other YouTubers on how to recap motherboards. But my method is actually different. When I remove caps that are this close to plastic parts, I use chip quick. This stuff is great. So I just place a big blob on each pad, like so. And this is just solder. With one big difference, it stays molten for much longer than regular solder. So, if we heat up both pads, we can just push that cap off the board. It doesn't get easier than this. And as you can see, the result is perfect. It doesn't apply much heat on the board, or any of the surrounding components or connectors. The important thing with this stuff here is that you have to make sure to clean all of the chip quick off. Because you don't want to solder with this stuff. So this is very kind on the pads. No mechanical stress whatsoever. All but one of the caps on this board are 47 micro 16 volts. If you're messing around with vintage Max, you should always keep a bag of those. Very quick and easy, and very kind on the board. You don't need much of this stuff either, so it's not expensive. I don't even remember how much I paid for it, because I've had it for years. A piece like this will last you a very long time. So don't go crazy and buy a large spool. Chip quick is removed the same way as regular solder. Just with regular solder wick. Yeah, those pads are fine. Several of the chips have legs with some heavy corrosion. That is easily fixed with a good flux. And a small amount of fresh solder. We might as well clean up the flux before we move on to the other side of the board. The easiest way to remove flux is to remove it while it's still warm and dip a q-tip in IPA and then I twist that stuff off by turning the q-tip oh this chip here definitely needs some attention too yeah that's much better nice and shiny pads and pins there's a similar thing going on with these larger chips too so I'll give them the same treatment. Some good flux. And then I just drag solder. Just by repeating the drag soldering. All bridges will come off. And the legs of the chips look as good as new again. And here's a close up after some cleaning. Okay, all pads and chip legs are taken care of. Now let's grab these caps. They are quite far from any plastic parts. So we might as well just use the rework station. If you don't have one, you could of course use chip quick on all of the caps. That is going to cost you a fraction of a rework station. And the important thing here is not to lift the cap. Instead, I push it sideways. That way we don't risk lifting the pads. So 
Same thing with these two caps. They are far enough from plastic parts. And that was actually the last cap. There aren't that many on these boards. And same thing with these pads. They still look good. So I'm glad I found these leaky boards. So I could fix them before they got worse. The important thing when using solder wick on pads is to never lift the tip of the solder wick. Because if you do, the solder wick will get stuck to the pad and you will rip the pad off. Now let's get some fresh caps on this board. And I'm going to go with these red caps. I hope they're good because I use them quite a lot. And the important thing here is, of course, polarity. I rather like these red caps. They look pretty good on these green boards. I have noticed that other YouTubers are using tantalums instead of electrolytics. But I'm still going for the original look. These are very likely going to last much longer than the original caps. You are going to need seven of these, by the way, if you're planning for this recap. I think I mentioned it already. These are 47 micro, 16 volts. All but one, actually. This last one here is a one micro, 50 volts. Luckily, I had ordered some for a PS2 project. So I guess we'll borrow it. I can always order some more for the PS2. Okay, that was the last cap. Before we test that board, let's try these PCBs. So this is an extremely simple project and yet very useful. I'll show on the screen here somewhere where I found this project on GitHub. So these are just tiny PCBs that are designed to take a coin cell very cheap holder like this. So these boards shouldn't take more than a few seconds to build. As you may know, batteries have destroyed many vintage Macs. I realize of course that modern batteries are probably going to be better, but I definitely prefer to use a coin cell. And that's how easy it is to build one of these. So, we can just install a coin cell and they fit inside the original battery holder on the motherboard. So, with the lid on, ah uh, yeah, it stays in place and it can't be easily pushed out. So yeah, these are perfect. What a great project. I just downloaded the files from the GitHub page. Uh, then ordered from PCB away. Okay, this board is ready for a test. Well, the classic case is still drying after the retrobrite process. So I guess I'll take care of the board from the classic too while I wait. This board has a lot more caps and a whole bunch of different values. So I don't have high hopes of finding all of these in my stash. But at least I'll remove all the caps and I'll see what I can find. The condition of this board is about the same. Lots of nasty corrosion on several of the chips and pads. But I can't see any permanent damage. Let's start with what I think is the trickiest one. So check out this guy here. I can just barely reach that pad with my tip. So there's just no way we could use a rework station on a cap like this. So let's have a go with chip quick nice big blob on the tip and I'm gonna have to be very careful here so close to those plastic parts and a big blob on this side too I think these cabs were glued because there is something left on the board here but might as well clean up these legs while I'm here very crusty pads. This board is a bit worse than the other board. 
I'm gonna have a second go with fresh flux on this pad and add some fresh solder. Yeah, that's much better. Nice and shiny again. And then we have these pads. This board is pretty crammed. So I don't have much room for my tip. Just enough to get the job done. Okay, nice and clean. Uh, none of the plastic parts are damaged. Same thing with these caps here. They are very close to this plastic connector here and this connector here. So we can't use the rework station here either, but that is not a problem with chip quick. Those guys should sponsor me. I love this stuff. I don't need to take notes about what caps I'm removing because there's a list on the webpage Recap a Mac. Oh, that one popped. <laughs> ah, it smells fish. Yuck. Disgusting little cap from the 90s. Okay, this one is going to be really tough to reach. Let me give this a try. Yes, it's just about reachable. Ah, it worked. Awesome. And that was really tight. Uh, no damage to the connector. But that was pretty close. I hope I didn't jump when that cap popped. <laughs> that would be embarrassing. Uh, I guess I'll find out when I edit this video. Uh, I guess I clean up this chip while I'm here. Nice and shiny again. Well, I guess the rest of the board is going to be... Pretty much the same process, so I'll skip ahead here, unless something interesting happens, like exploding caps. The rest of the board was easy, I just used the rework station. Unfortunately I don't have all the caps for this board. I really wasn't expecting to do this project this week, but at least we have saved this board. And we'll of course order the caps and install them in a future video. So let's move on to the Color Classic. If you have watched the restoration video about this machine, you may have made the same guess as I have. Check out these two diodes down here. Let me move in closer. This machine came to me pretty much unused. And yet, these diodes have discolored the PCB, so they must be incredibly toasty. Toasty components on old PCBs is not unusual, but this machine is barely used. So I'd say those diodes, they must be incredibly hot. The diodes are probably still good, but they sit very close to this cap. So I think that cap has been cooked. Let's pull it off the board and measure it. Yeah, check this out. So here are our two diodes. And that board is so toasty. The solder mask has come off here. And it has started to peel off on this side too. And here's our suspect cap. Let's pull that cap off. And see if it has completely dried up. Okay, the camera was off, but I popped that cap out. I guess this must be a design mistake. Or perhaps there is a fault on the board. Let me know if you have one of these boards, and if your board is damaged like my board is. Okay, so this is a Nichicon 3300, 16 volts. It has been discolored on this side here. So let's measure it. Three thousand microfarad so that's roughly 10% off so that is not an extremely bad value actually I'm a bit surprised here 
Okay, so how about the ESR? Well, the ESR is good too. Oh crap, maybe I was wrong. Yeah, I think my guess was wrong. Here's a brand new cap. Uh, we're getting about the same. So, how about these diodes? Okay, let's check these diodes. These guys got so hot, the paint is actually coming off. 0.72, that is almost okay. And same thing here. And if we check the other direction, we're getting nothing. Uh, nothing. So these guys actually measure okay too. Maybe my guess was completely off. Well, damaged or not, I'm going to replace them with new parts. Uh, I'm going to solder these diodes way off the board. And we're also going to check the temperature once the board is running. Okay, I did some thinking here. And I think I'm going to solder this cap off the board too. And lay it to its side. To move it away from those diodes. And here's the result. The cap is laying flat and moved away from these diodes. And these diodes are standing far away from the board. I guess I could pry them apart. So they don't cook each other. Well, this is going to improve things quite a bit, but the question remains, why are they getting so hot? Let's install this board and check how hot they get. Before we do, I better glue that cap in place. I need some hot glue because it's quite large and a bit flimsy the way we installed it. Okay, time for a test. Let's start with the Macintosh Classic. I cleaned the connector with some deoxid. The retrobride process went well, but I think I should have left it for one more hour. I think it should be more grey than this, but it looks really good. So I'm gonna leave it like this, at least for now. So this machine was stored away with the label quick test OK, but that was before the cap started to leak. So let's switch the power on and see if it works. Well, it chimes, and the hard drive spins up, and we're getting something on the screen. And it works, awesome. But that hard drive is either broken, or the previous owner may have erased it. Let me see if I can find a diskette. I guess we better clean those heads. Well, perhaps it's not needed, because this machine was so clean inside. Now, that took some persuasion, so that's a bad drive. Well, I guess we should make sure the problem isn't with the cleaning diskettes. Now, let's try regular diskettes. Now, it takes some persuasion. To insert the diskettes and then it just ejects. No, that drive is shot. Crap. Okay, well the drive needs service, but the machine is working. So let's move to the next machine. Okay, moving on to the Classic 2. Okay, so this Mac came to me with a garbled screen. We obviously can't test the logic board, since it's missing all the caps. But we can test the rest of the system. Okay, it chimes, and the hard drive spins up. We're getting something on the screen. We have a cursor. Yeah, that analog board and tube seems to be working just fine. Although it might have a problem with the hard drive because it sounds like it's spinning up and then down 
and it keeps repeating. No, I think that hard drive is shot. Let's try with a cleaning diskette in the diskette drive. I'll reboot for the drive to start seeking and clean those heads. Hmm, that didn't work. It still tries to boot from the hard drive and it can't. I'll disconnect the hard drive and turn it on again. Okay, now it cleaned the heads. I'll give it a second go. Now let's boot to a diskette and see if that works. We've got a happy Mac and an error. Huh. Well, I'm curious to find out what the problem is here. So I borrowed the hard drive from the Color Classic. As far as I know, that is a working hard drive with System 7.5. Okay, let's see if it boots. I'm not very impressed with that Canon fan. It's rather noisy. Okay, I think it boots. So, not sure what that error was. I guess my diskette could be bad. Well, the analog board and the display clearly works. Okay, let's try that diskette drive with a different diskette. Yes, it works. Okay, so I'll leave this machine until I have some fresh caps for it. Okay, time for the weird and wonderful color classic. So we had black screen, it chimes and we have high voltage. Now let's see if it made any difference replacing that fried cap. Fingers crossed. Well, still chimes. Ah, no. Well, I wasn't expecting much. But unfortunately, I guessed wrong. We still have a black screen. Okay, let's make sure our battery works. It does. So, let's make sure it's not a bad connection. I guess we could pull those RAM chips too. Oh, by the way, I wonder if, if I snatched these two RAMs from the classic. That's actually quite likely. Okay, fingers crossed. Uh, no, unfortunately not. It wasn't that easy. Well, I have of course checked for leaky caps on this board, but I couldn't find any. And a lot of these caps are Nichicon, so that's why I'm not recapping it, at least not yet. If we can't find a fault today, I guess that would be the next step. So this Mac had a very glitchy graphics before it stopped working completely. So my next bet are the adjustment pots on the analog board. They are hiding away inside this plastic box. So first we need to open up this can. I guess we could remove this connector first. And I have checked the caps inside here too. Uh, they looked fine. Not an easy can to open up. Okay, I probably skipped ahead here. But that took a while to get off. I don't think this machine has caps on the neck board. But I guess I'll double check. Okay, let's move this out of the way. And see how this comes off. I think it's held in place with these tabs. This is a bit odd. I wonder why they decided to hide them away. Inside this plastic thing here. And here they are. Tons of them. That is going to be a pain to readjust after I have cleaned them. Okay, so I'm thinking if I adjust these pots and one of them is bad, we should see at least something on the screen. Okay, we've got high voltage. Oh, you're kidding me. We've got something on the screen. It boots. Mac is working. The chime sounds kind of weird. And I think that's because we don't have the back cover on. 
because the sound, weirdly enough, on this machine is grounded through the shield. Not the best design choice. Well, I'm not sure what to make of this. I did touch a few of those pots to pick the correct tool for this machine. Well, I'm a bit stumped here. Did touching those pots make a difference? Or is it something else? Well, I guess we might as well see if they're glitchy, since we have the lid off. So I'll just start with this one and try them all out. Oh, I just noticed something. Two of the pots are completely filled with dust. That's a bit odd. And it's the two pots that are accessible through the back. So are these Macs sucking in dust through those tiny holes? I don't have any other explanation. But that's what it looks like. Yeah, check out these dust bunnies. How weird. Well, I guess I'll just go through all of these. Unless something interesting happens. Well, this is how it was behaving before it went blank. Okay, that was all the pots at the back. And two more on the side here. And of course they use a different tool. The display on this machine, by the way, is amazing. I know the camera is making a bloody mess of it. But in real life, that is a very nice Sony. I guess I should do a test for consistency. Oh, there you have it. I mean, it's still glitchy. Well, I guess I might as well make all the adjustments. Uh, leave it on to see what happens. Yeah, still flickering. Definitely not okay. Yeah, that flickers like crazy. So let's clean those pots. Well, I soaked all the pots in the oxide. But they are sort of sealed, so I can't really tell if the dioxide found its way inside. So I'll turn all the pots a few times back and forth and see if that makes a difference. Well, I've been messing around some more with the pots and it hasn't been glitchy for quite a while now. I am obviously skipping ahead quite a lot here. So since it's not doing anything interesting right now, let's check the temperature of those diodes. Oh, here they are. Well, that is quite toasty. Not as extreme as I thought. About 92 Celsius. So, not as extreme as I thought. Well, we've got nothing going on on the display now. It seems to be working. At least right now. I'm not sure how long I should leave it without the lid. Because the fan is actually in the lid. So, I'll put the lid back on and leave it. Well, this is interesting. Now it won't boot. So is this just a coincidence? Or do those faults have something in common? I'll try to reboot. No, the hard drive just spun down. Did that hard drive just die? What a messy video. If you have never seen one of these Macs in real life, here's a size comparison with a CRT display. These Macs are like miniature computers. They are really fun to mess around with. I installed the diskette drive from the Classic 2 in the Classic 1. The hard drive is actually working in this machine. I have installed System 7.5, so this Mac here is actually fully working now. That means I can make that mystery diskette I need for an upcoming video. The Classic 2 now has the bad diskette drive and no caps on the logic board. That hard drive was shot, so I'll have to find a suitable replacement. I'll order some caps and restore the diskette drive in another video. The hard drive did indeed die in the Color Classic. I checked it in another system. It just spins up and then it spins down again. I found a matching replacement drive and installed System 7.5. Unfortunately, there is still something wrong with the display. If I don't come up with something more to try within a week or so, I'll order a full set of caps for the analog board. Share your thoughts if you think there's anything I should try first. And now is a good time to watch the Color Classic restoration video if you haven't watched it yet. I'd like to end this video by saying thank you to my patrons. Thank you for your support. If you want to become a supporter of this channel too, consider becoming a patron. Patrons get early access whenever possible. You can also support me with a like and a comment. 
If you're a regular viewer, consider subscribing to this channel. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next week.